Hello and welcome to the first episode of Insights, an interview series brought to you by NALSA Center for Tax Laws, supported by Taxman. I am delighted to introduce our first guest, Senior Advocate Tarun Gulati, one of the most sought-after lawyers in the country, particularly in the area of taxation. Tarun sir brings along with him an experience spanning across three decades, where he has often represented leading industrial conglomerates on several contentious issues of law before the high courts, uh, before several high courts and Supreme Court as well. Over the course of this episode, we look forward to gaining some insights into the practice of law and taxation from Tarun sir's journey in this profession. We would also be seeking Tarun sir's opinions and insights on a very controversial and contentious, contentious issue of law, which is regarding the manner in which SET has been disallowed as a business expenditure under the Finance Act. On behalf of NALSA Center for Tax Law, sir, I thank you once again for taking out time from your busy schedule. Uh, so yeah, thank you once again, sir, and we can begin with the interview. Thanks uh, a lot, Anurag, for inviting me, and thank you, NALSA. It's always a pleasure to be among students and to contribute in whatever little way one can to give back to the profession. I think it's extremely important for all of us to be participative in a student's journey into the profession. And it's my pleasure and my privilege. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, sir. So, sir, I want to begin my first questions. We are uh, having a series for students and so that we, all students can learn. I want to take you back to a time when you were a junior. When you had begun, you had completed your CA first, then you did law, you practiced in Allahabad for a while. Then you moved to uh, Delhi and you worked with uh, senior advocate Joseph Velapalli. So my first question is, sir, was law an obvious choice from your right from the very beginning or when you were a junior, when you were a student, you wanted to go in a different area? So my journey started in a very different way. In fact, uh, while I belong to a family of lawyers and judges, law was always on the horizon, but it was never the first choice because I was, as a student, I was academically very, very interested in accounting and finance. And I took very naturally to it while I was in school. I did law and CA simultaneously. It's not really that, uh, you know, law happened later, but uh, I took up registration as a lawyer because the degree came first and then mm. had to suspend it when my chartered accountancy got old. And while uh, I was doing my articles, I and initially in the first three years when I practiced as a chartered accountant, I tried my hand at just about everything, audit, finance, in fact, arranging IPOs, uh, accounting, pure accounting, tax, appearance before authorities, appearance before the income tax appellate tribunal, all of it, the whole, I mean, I would say that uh, when I tried my hand at different, uh, you know, stuff spanning both finance and law, I found my comfort in law. And I had an inclination that this is what I will enjoy the rest of my life. And that's how my decision got made. It wasn't an early decision. Some people say that you lost out three years. I don't think I did lose out anything there. You know, all your experiences add up ultimately and help you in your professional life. So my journey wasn't that straight. And uh, I think there was a bit of an exploratory uh, period, which I think for all juniors is important. Because ultimately, if you are able to zero down on something that you have a passion for, you will not only succeed, you will enjoy your professional life. And that's uh, what I think was very important from my angle. Yes, sir. I mean, I'm sure even working as a child accountant for a while would have given you an insight into the practice of accountancy. And that yes. also, of course, helps with uh, tax laws and all that, right? Yes. Apart from that, it also uh, made me clear up my mind that accounting and finance is not what I would like to do the rest of my life. Yes, sir. The, in the, the field of law, the field of taxation law, while many people find it quite boring and insipid, really interested me. And uh, it's also because I have a finance background, it, it, I really took to it. I would enjoy this for the rest of my professional career. And it really gave me clarity. So I think that that's a very important uh, part of your professional journey where you explore and you come to a clear decision on what you want to pursue. That's when you, know, you get direction and you, you, uh, 
it leads to some amount of success i think absolutely sir so sir uh, my second question is in a way connected to the same thing where you worked as a junior with senior advocate joseph bellapalli and even he was known to be a renowned tax lawyer at that time so how would you describe your journey in that chambers like what are the life lessons you learned over there and lessons you would like to let's say carry on and you know give it to our students i think mr velapati was uh, it continues to be one of the not just a leading professional a fantastic human being and you know i got both professional as well as personal life lessons which i hold very dear to this day uh, his was a very 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 lean practice i used to be his only chamber junior okay. he wouldn't keep more than one he, he would operate in a small 10 by 10 10 kind of room as an office he was one of the leading senior counsel in supreme court in tax at that time and uh, the best of work so i got ex- extremely good exposure his practice was not just uh, tax in fact he was an indirect tax professional i had never done indirect tax before joining him. i was a direct mm-hmm. tax professional earlier and apart from that he used to do a lot of commercial law Uh, a lot of mrtp clb uh, company law court uh, kind of work national consumer uh, forum ncdrc a lot of commercial work and he had a very very solid grounding in civil law so that i think was a huge learning for me that while you may know your tax law but if you're deficient on the other uh, parts of because tax law also comes out of civil law and the principles of Uh, civil law administrative law remain the same in tax practice and that i think was the biggest exposure to me that how to you know uh, how to ground yourself in different fields so that you can bring those facets in your practice in tax law apart from that i think uh, the kind of down to down to earth person he was the uh, amount of control and ambition that he had was something that you know if i am able to emulate in my life i think i'll i'll be a i'll be a very happy person the sense of uh, professionalism the focus on relief how when you go into court you know how do you you know uh, deal with you know court mannerisms how to make a reputation in court is something which i think was absolutely fabulous as far as he is concerned you know the judges in the supreme court would uh, say that if mr velapalli has said something we will take we won't even open the file we will take it as good to build that kind of a reputation you have to you know have integrity about yourself you have to say the right thing you have to forget that you are appearing for a particular client and your first duty is towards court these are very important lessons that he taught me uh, while i was with him and i hold these very dear and and i can tell you you know in today's time especially youngsters they want to argue everything in court mr velapalli taught us something which was very important how to keep relief and focus what are you going to court for and don't argue too much his his one uh, he used to say that you know a very important part of advocacy is when to stop and when not to say something and if you can you know get out of court with some relief that you can get for your client including a remand many people will not be happy, happy with the remand because the proceedings don't get over but he's, he used to always say that you got something yeah you live to fight another day you argue too much and you end up with a zero a remand is much better than that so these are very important practical insights into the uh, advocacy part which i think uh, today all seniors should be actually teaching their juniors in fact supreme court recently said that every senior who spent more than 20 years should train 15 juniors i think these are issues which you don't learn at law college i these are only practice related uh, issues which i think any good senior should be teaching their juniors absolutely sir there's a lot for us to think about in like the kind of lessons that you have shared and i mean one, of course one is always grateful to have a mentor who guides you in your initial stages and gives you such valuable lessons that you carry on for life so sir i had another question regarding your initial years in practice how different or how similar was tax practice let's say two decades ago versus now 
do you see any changes or shifts in the dominant trends in litigation or has it largely remained static no the practice has changed and the manner in which we deal with matters and with clients has also changed uh one of course the aggression of the tax authorities has changed if i talk about tax practice the aggression amongst lawyers has changed the competition levels have changed uh law used to be a very conservative field and you know uh, people would never think of going to a client's premises hmm. to come to lawyer's premises today we see lawyers going making presentations pitching for work all of that which was not so prevalent at when we started off so track the nature of the practice is changing you have uh, social media infiltration now quite a bit you find lawyers marketing themselves quite aggressively uh, on social media they are putting out stuff on social media which was never done earlier you know you would have once in a while a seminar somewhere but uh, today you know there is a flood of information available on kind all kinds of media and lawyers are expected to there is nothing wrong with it but the nature of the practice has changed and and client expectations have changed as well you know the clients are also very well informed and they are very aggressive in what they want timelines that they demand are very different from what it used to be earlier so the profession is changing with covid uh, inducement of technology into the profession is again a good and a bad thing how earlier as uh, nobody would ever dream of asking a senior counsel to come on call whether it's a video call of course was not even uh, you know heard of even on a telephonic call he would never discuss an issue on a telephone it would always be a physical meeting today the preferred uh, route is you know a, a vc so all of this these are some of these changes are very good and i think it they help they help mitigate cost they help uh, productivity in a large manner some of them are not so good you know especially uh, the flood of information on social media is something which i really don't appreciate and and it sometimes uh, i would like the profession to continue to be some uh more conservative than uh, you know yes in the new age in that sense and uh, in the face marketing by lawyers is something which i don't really appreciate that much and uh, while you know academic pursuits uh, writing on subjects publications and speaking are all very good and should be encouraged but at the same time uh, law being what it is there has to be a boundary and one should you know uh, stop somewhere is what i feel yes sir so so you raise a very interesting point about technology and the way it's changing the current tax practice so i want to get your opinion on one issue for the past few years courts have been largely functioning on time with uh, video conferencing becoming a norm across high courts and the supreme court as well so so what do you see the main difference as between making submissions online versus let's say making it physically in court as if you have a preference for either of them and how do you see the difference playing out let's say in your ability to convince the judge for example the uh, court hearing is not just about saying what you are saying there is a there is a connect that you make with the judge advocacy is also not just the law but also about your interpersonal skills the body language the eye contact with the judge the physicality of a hearing is extremely important a lot which happens in court the manner in which you stand the manner in which you shift the way you speak the way you respond all of that is well some part of it can be done on screen but as uh, uh, an electronic medium does not have the same uh, connect as a physical medium so while this is this is extremely productive in the sense that you can achieve much more in a day when you are online the wastage of time is uh, much lesser than what you would have in physical court but at the same time the efficacy of a hearing is much better in physical form is what i feel and uh, 
they, they aren't substitutes. So, especially for a contentious final hearing case, I would much prefer to argue it physically than online. Yes, sir. Even as law students, when we intern in high courts, we do see the thrill, let's say, of the physical hearings. And yeah. even I uh, understand. Yeah. In a physical hearing, a minute of silence is something that is absolutely fine. In an electronic medium, it it stares at you, it speaks out to you to say that nothing is happening on screen. So it takes away the, you know, the normalcy of a hearing. Somebody's thinking, somebody's, you know, discussing, keeping quiet. All of that happens in a physical hearing much better than on online. Silence jars online. Yes, sir. So, sir, uh, thank you for uh, your views on these questions. So we'll now move on to discussing the main topic for today, which is on the issue of cess and the manner in which the current Finance Act has disallowed cess as expenditure. So uh, for a brief context for our viewers, a controversy had uh, arose in the context of Section 40 of the Income Tax Act, which said that no tax can be dedu deducted as business expenditure while computing profits. So the controversy was just the term tax include cess as well. We had some decisions from the Bombay High Court and Rajasthan High Court, which held that tax does not include SES, which is why the SSPs can claim it as expenditure. And several ITATs followed as well, with the exception of ITAT Kolkata. And this year, we have seen that the Finance Act introduced uh, a clarificatory amendment, at least it's called a clarificatory amendment, stating that the term tax under Section 40 shall have always deemed to have included SES as well. And for any claims of this uh, business expenditure in the form of SES, that had been accepted earlier. Under Section 155 right now, they deem it to be under reporting of income for the purpose of Section 270A. And consequently, you could face penalty. However, if you voluntarily make a disclosure and pay the amount, the differential tax right now, there would not be any penalty. So this is the broad context, sir. My question basically is, how do we view this explanation and this amendment, you know, deeming the accepted claims to be under reporting of income? from its constitutional validity perspective, as well as its like broader trends in tax litigation. So let's start with the constitutional validity questions. Do you see any issues constitutionally with this retrospective amendment? See, one thing is clear that unfortunately, so let me just say one thing straight up on this, that constitutional validity apart, this is an extremely unfair provision. And uh, Unfortunately, I see it more as an executive overreach, and I'll, I'll say why. And unfortunately, the legislature rubber stamps these kind of amendments without really any debate at all. So it's while the legislature's power to make laws prospectively and retrospectively are plenary, and they can do so. And that's what our courts have said. But where we are getting to now is that the government wants to win in every situation. This is an amendment which not only overrides High Court judgments, as you said, Sesa Goa and Bombay High Court and Chambal Fertilizers, Rajasthan High Court, had created a distinction between the words cess and tax and said, and they've gone into the historical background of this provision to say that when in the 1961 Act was introduced, 40A2, which is a specific provision for disallowance of tax as a business expenditure, did contain the word cess. However, later it was deleted. This is the basis of the judgment. Now, if this is the basis of the judgment and tax and cess mean two different things. And everybody knows that tax statutes have to be interpreted strictly. There was nothing wrong in these judgments. And if courts have interpreted this judgment, we come to the second principle, the legislature has a right to take a contrary position, but only by removing the lacuna that the court had pointed out. Simpliciter overriding a court judgment is not something which is permissible and cannot be. In this case, if the amendment had been to section 40A2 to say, tax includes cess. Substantively, you are now saying tax includes cess. 
the high court judgment stands overridden on its own because of this amendment but you don't choose to do so you try to bring in an explanation which is retrospective from 2005 so it's not really clarificatory it's a retrospective substantive amendment and there's a difference between clarificatory amendments and retrospective substantive amendments retrospective substantive amendments can be struck down as being arbitrary in Shaira Banu's case, Justice Nariman has reiterated challenge to statutory provisions on manifest arbitrariness. So it's not just the fact that the legislature has the power to make a retrospective amendment. It's a question of whether such an amendment will be seen as arbitrary. And in this case, I think this is arbitrary. More so when you read the memorandum explaining the amendment. The memorandum explaining the amendment pretty much calls the High Court judgments per incurium. Now, this is a clear case of executive overreach. The memorandum is not framed by the legislature. It is done by the executive. For the executive to say that the High Court judgment is per incurium because an ITIT judgment somewhere else has gone into the issue and noticed the fact that the cesses were brought in as a surcharge and tax includes a surcharge is according to me absolutely the incorrect way of going about overriding high court judgments. On this short point alone, I think this amendment should be struck down. Secondly, what they do, they make, and it's a very ingenious way of doing this, they frame it as part of an explanation. Law on explanation is also very clear. Law on explanation is that the explanation, while it is part of a substantive provision, cannot override the main provision. That's one. Second, just because you use the word clarify, it does not mean that it's a clarificatory amendment. A court is entitled to go into, to, into the provision to see whether it's substantive in nature and whether the intent of the legislature was to include or exclude tax. Two high courts have already interpreted that there was a conscious deletion of the word cess from 40A2. Then nobody can say that the intent of the legislature was always to include cess unless you amend the provision itself and include it. So, according to me, this explanation tries to go beyond the main section, again, liable to be struck down on that. Third, when we speak about 155.18, what they have done is they have sought to give a rectification power to the assessing officer to achieve what they could not achieve earlier. Thereby meaning that even concluded proceedings can be reopened, not just reopened. They put the onus on the assessing to voluntarily come and comply and pay up. And by doing that, what they are doing is that they are imposing a, an obligation on the SSC at, in present time to make a compliance. And failure to do so will entail penalty. And in levying penalty, all the defenses available to an SSC under Section 270A are being taken away. This again is arbitrary. I don't know whether a court will ultimately strike it down on the basis of retrospective penalties because an obligation is being created at present to comply with the law. But it is certainly unfair. And therefore, there are extremely good grounds for a challenge to a provision like this. And somewhere, I think the course of, uh, of uh, our courts should change and the courts must come down heavily on attempts like these to really get over decisions which are uh, which are binding decisions you know the executive cannot override high court judgments like this that's what that's my personal opinion yes sir so so this whole controversy has intrigued me a lot as well and right you had rightly pointed out that rectification orders can't just be passed because you know later on to unsettled cases that have already been settled. 
So in this context, I had a query regarding the amendment because when we see the bad text of section one hundred and fifteen sub clause eighteen, they say that the officer can pass rectification orders for a period up to four years, beginning from April first, twenty twenty one. So now in this context, the query is how far back can the assessing officer go while passing rectification orders and you know reassessing income? For example, can the assessing officer pick up a case from let's say two thousand six or two thousand seven? And pass rectification orders in case they have claimed such as you know an expenditure. So, my question is basically, how on this particular question in general, how do we see this as part of the larger trend and the controversy surrounding reassessment, reopening of uh, assessments and rectification? Because that is being heavily litigated right now as well with the recent amendments, Section One Forty Eight. So, how do you see this as a narrow issue of law and as well as the broader trends in tax litigation? See, the law was very clear on. subsequent events leading to either rectification or reassessment supreme court in mepco's case had said that you can't make a rectification on the basis of a subsequent judgment i think the case of simplex concrete piles again by the supreme court said that you can't make a reassessment on the basis of a subsequent judgment because it would amount to a change of opinion given that kind of a law to say now given giving a statutory power to make a rectification when the amendment is retrospective from 2005 i think the assessing officer can take up assessments after 2005 for all these years the large period available to the assessing officer to rectify proceedings and rectification we know can be done only on errors apparent from record can somebody consider this as an error apparent from record now that the statute has given him this handle i don't think that issue will even arise because there's a statutory framework which requires him to rectify on this issue the large limitation itself is a ground for challenge that you cannot pick up assessments for 15 16 years this is just justice nariman's judgment in, again in the supreme court which says that subsequent amendment will not give life to something which is already dead a remedy which is already over its, its limitation has expired even if you make a subsequent amendment that cannot revive that remedy that principle will apply here as well supreme court i think in jk synthetics case when amendment was made from 1944 in rule 9 and 49 of the central excise rules Said that it will have to be limited to five years, which was the statutory limitation period in the Act. So, if assessments for from two thousand five onwards are picked up, I think those with even without challenging the amendment, or you can challenge the amendment and ask for a reading down of the amendment to say that it can't be beyond the period of reassessment which is allowed. Of course, this is not even a reassessment. Rectification itself has a limitation of four years. Yes, sir. So somebody can argue to say that you can't pick up assessments beyond four years. You may have four years from now rectify, but in so far as close proceedings are concerned, you can't change that for fifteen years, sixteen years. That will be considered as arbitrary. The amendment itself will be liable to be struck down if that were to be done. Yes, sir. These definitely seem like some very valid grounds on which the amendments actually can be challenged. So, sir, I mean, the whole issue of retrospective tax amendments have been plaguing our tax regime for quite a while. I mean, just last year, the Act was for the Tax Am- Amendment Act, which sought to undo the whole Vodafone and Can saga. And the government made emphatic submissions that you know we want to uphold rule of law and that retrospectivity is not what the government wants. So, sir, in light of the current amendments disallowing such as business expenditure. Do you think anything has changed since last year, and how hopeful are you for the attitude of the administration in the coming years? You see, unfortunately, we don't seem to learn. When an international tribunal holds your amendments to be not consistent with the rule of law, unfair, arbitrary, and grants an award against you, I think it should have been an eye opener. statements have been made by successive finance ministers who say that we will not make retrospective amendments but unfortunately again this is the executive which is not seeing seeming to come 
and the legislature is keeping silent on proposals like these. These are there's a there's a uh, doctrine of fairness also, which in some early judgments of the Supreme Court have been quite emphatically stated to say that uh, a, a statement also confirm to you know fairness. Uh, fairness is also a part of Article 14 in some sense. While tax and equity don't go together, but at the same time, when a retrospective substantive amendment is made. I think it does give rise to many questions and uh, it is unfair, it is unsettling, and it does not conform to the rule of law as known throughout the world. There, yes. are, there are important texts which have laid down what rule of law means. Law should be Law, law should be simple to understand, it should be consistent, should not be retrospective ordinarily. The power of retrospectivity available to the parliament does not mean that it should be accessible lightly. Just because the power is available to you does not mean that you will exercise it in what is this amendment about that we are talking about? Says how many SECs would have claimed it? Why do you want to win in every? You allow if if you were so aggrieved by the high court decisions, why don't you appeal it to the Supreme Court every other day? Supreme Court reverses decisions of the high court and holds in favor of the revenue. Why should you adopt a shortcut like this? So, to my mind, are we learning? Answer is no. But we must we must stop this practice as a country if we want to hold out to the world that our system of law is fair fair you know those of course Ken and Vodafone were international clients and they could take the government take on the government in an international forum what about our domestic assistance they are left nowhere with something like this and I think our government must treat our domestic assistance more fairly than they were forced to treat an international SSC that's okay. fine. Yes, sir. So you, you raise some very pertinent issues which we must all introspect on as members of the legal fraternity, particularly the issue about the memorandum to the finance bill, about the manner in which without going to Supreme Court and declaring high court decisions to be per inquiry. It remains to be seen whether the Supreme Court will actually take cognizance of this issue and how it would deal with this. So, sir, I had a tangential question, as in not exactly in the position of law, but on how do you exactly advise clients? Because when retrospective amendments are becoming the norm, do you ever take into consideration the possibility of future amendment while giving opinions in the present? Does that ever happen or that's uh, not something that you would consider? No, I wouldn't consider that. We live in hope that sense will prevail. So yes. you, you go according to the law that exists as of now. You advise on remedies which are available to the client. And uh, you can, of course, uh, extrapolate to say that in every case where you are right, the government will come out with a retrospective amendment. So we don't really consider that while advising clients. You know, that's uh, for the government to do at a later stage if they were to if they were to adopt that. But at this stage, I don't think one can anticipate a retrospective amendment while advising a client. That's not done. Yes, sir. So, since we are uh, reaching the time that we have scheduled for the interview, I had just one last question. Tax, as you know, it's an ever changing landscape. Like every day, the law changes a lot. And there's a lot of development both in direct tax and in indirect tax. So, in this situation, sir, I want to ask you what advice would you give to, let's say, law students and junior lawyers and even child accountants for that matter who are beginning their journey in this area of law? What are some lessons, skills that we have to keep in mind while approaching this particular domain of law? See, as I said, tax law is not something that you can practice in a cocoon. You should not practice tax law in a cocoon. It's not a silo, which is, you know, where you are in, where you will be. Today, tax practice is changing dramatically. You see how many arrests are being made in tax matters. You see, so if you don't have the knowledge of criminal law, if you don't have the knowledge of other economic offenses like 
पी एम एल ए और द ब्लैक मनी एक्ट और कॉफी पोसा और एंड दीज ऑल इन्वॉल्व फैसेट्स ऑफ क्रिमिनल योर सिविल लॉज अराइज ऑफ एन टाइम यू नो वेदर यू नो दी पी सी सो आई थिंक फॉर एनी बडी हु to practice tax law these allied laws are also very important and before you jump into a specialization it would be important for you to have a broad variety of work so that it gives you a good base to build on that's one second i think uh, from a tax perspective in law school your study of the tax subjects is not that detailed that's what i feel and tax being a super specialized subject it would help students to either have a diploma or a masters degree in tax if they really want to seriously pursue the subject this is not i always feel that tax being such a complex subject a tax lawyer can do many other things he can do tax and other things but a person who hasn't done tax can't do tax that well because this requires up to date knowledge this requires a skill set which takes a lot of time so while in the initial years you must explore at some stage you will have to you know delve deep into the subject and concentrate on it. that's what i feel uh, students should do and it is not boring at all it's extremely interesting you know uh, the popular belief that tax is tough and boring i don't i think we need to dispel that i think students must law students must must get into this subject it's very very interesting absolutely sir so thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule it has been a pleasure and i'm sure all the viewers of this video would have learned a lot more about this area of and about general skills that you would require not just in your profession but also life so once again thank you so much sir thank you so much uh, nurag for inviting me and i wish you all the best uh, and i hope uh, more and more students from nalsar actually nalsar and other law colleges actually take up tax we look forward to a young vibrant tax bar yes sir we also look forward to your mentorship mentorship as the supreme court has said every senior must mentor or you know teach 15 juniors so even we look forward to a day when that becomes the norm absolutely absolutely we must thank you thank you sir